Hello there and welcome to the first proper episode of Long Read Club. Uh, we've traded the hot Florida sunshine for the cold and windy uh, Birmingham day. Uh, but we're going to go back to AGBT and talk with Dr. Jill Hirschlev, uh, application scientist at 10X responsible for their sample prep, who's got some interesting insights to tell us about the best ways to prepare high molecular DNA extractions for long reads. I hope you're enjoying Long Read Club. Uh, make sure you hit the bell to subscribe to the YouTube channel and look out for part two of this video where Jill will be giving uh, a thorough presentation about uh, her best tips for extracting ultra high molecular weight DNA from a variety of samples. See you later. So, hi Jill. Hi Nick. Welcome to Long Read Club. Thank you. Thanks for taking your time. Did you enjoy AGBT? Yes, very much so. <laughs> um, what were your highlights? Uh, my highlights this year were seeing the first human chromosome. Okay. Tip to tip. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Well, I've been working with high molecular weight DNA since 2002. Maybe before it was cool. No, not not really, but certainly when it was much more of a niche field, and we had dreams of being able to do assemblies like this with long range scaffolding and then short short read sequencing and now I think finally it's coming to fruition and it's not easy right like that's the thing I appreciated from Adam's talk today is that even though it's possible to do the centromere with ultra long reads it's still a lot of effort and still requires manual intervention so mm. I expect that to improve in the coming years but it was still it was, it was really nice to see pretty phenomenal so Jill Adam showed an amazing new human genome assembly uh, made with a whole combination of technologies. We didn't really talk very much about how you do the sample preparation and extraction. Uh, have you got any uh, tips you can give us about the, the right techniques to use to be able to generate these kind of very long read data? Yes, there's loads I could say about this. <laughs> <laughs> to keep it really, really simple, this is challenging. It's a challenging sample type to work with and there are numbers of different methods that one can use. But something we like in the lab and we come back to time and time again is a method called salting out. It's really, really simple. It was published in the 80s and the protocol is incredibly short and it's essentially just two steps. Step one is you pop open your cells and lyse them. Uh, you do that in a low salt buffer and you add a little bit of proteinase K to clean up the chromatin. And then step two is you just do a couple precipitations and you end up with really nice, intact, beautiful DNA molecules. And what I think is so powerful about a technique like that is that it's very self-explanatory and it's easy to understand what you're doing and why, and then it's guidance on how to alter the protocol to suit your needs. So we tested it first on mammalian cultured cells, which is probably the easiest sample type that one can think of. It's just a bag of cytoplasm. Mm. Uh, but then we extended it to human blood, and all we have to do is add a red blood cell lysis step. We've tested it on tissue where you have to add a homogenization step where we use the downser, um, or you can use single insects if you chop them up with a razor blade. So it's, it's understanding the modularity of these techniques and then having the confidence to go in and tweak different knobs because you know exactly what's in the buffers at every step. Mm. So we find it powerful, we find it kind of fun, um, and really it's an easy way to get started. So sorting out is your, kind of your go-to method. It's so what we try first. Yeah. You know, we've been doing this for enough years that it's it's what you reach for first ends up being the most powerful. We have a bunch of different methods in our arsenal, but salting out is what we try first all the time. Okay. So are there are there homogenization techniques that you favor that you found work? You know, with with these kind of more recalcitrant species that that, we, that people are interested in now. Yeah, I think you know a lot of people do grinding and liquid nitrogen and that's not something that we have a lot of experience with. Mm -hmm. We try and keep things in buffer in in chilled buffer when we do homogenization. So what we like to do if you're dealing with any kind of animal tissue, it can be a tough tissue um, as long as it's not really crunchy, you can put it in a lysis buffer and just use the plastic downs and really gently, and it's up and down. It's not side to side because you'll make me cry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you destroy your nuclei, you want right, right. what you want to do is release the nuclei from the cells, but you don't want to smear or smush. Right. So it's again, it's gentle, gentle motions with a pestle. And alternatively, you can what we do with insects or things that are a little more crunchy is you can put a cold drop of buffer on the slide and with a razor blade mince. And again, not not drag or okay. crush, but if you go up and down with a very sharp blade, you can homogenize the tissue really well. So this well. is like chopping chopping salad. You want to yes. Uh, you want you, you don't want to cause crushing. That's yes, the idea. exactly. Okay, very good. Exactly. Um, so, 
have you have you found anything that you just fundamentally can't extract from, or you can't extract high molecular weight DNA from? You know, what's been hard for me, and also working at 10X, where people will write in with their, their favorite organism, it's not something we've tested, and I almost, I don't even know where to go for advice. Mm -hmm. I don't even know where to start. People will ask, literally, they've asked about barnacles, they've asked about starfish, mm -hmm. sea, sea cucumbers, pine trees, redwood trees, everything under the sun, mm -hmm. and I, I feel like I'm not always able to offer something very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's where I've seen the community, Long Read Club, Protocols.io, that's where I see incredible value in the community there because there are people working with these really you know, exotic and extreme samples for us. We focus mainly on mammalian. Mm. Um, so I think people can use some of our core techniques, or not our core techniques, salting out is not our technique. Uh, we just like to use it a lot. But if you combine some of the upstream homogenization you find elsewhere in the literature and kind of Frankenstein the protocols right, together. Because right. that's what we see all the time is people Frankensteining protocols. Yeah. And a lot of our techniques too are Frankenstein. You take bits here and for bits from here and bits from there. And as long as you understand yeah. what each bit is doing, that's the key. You don't blindly put things together. You use your good scientific skills yeah. Yeah. to yeah. make educated decisions. You try it out in the lab and that's how you ultimately find think, success. You know, maybe we're in a situation where we've got we've got pretty used to using uh, kitted reagents now. And, and of course, they've been they've been great in the NGS uh, era, but, mm -hmm. but maybe kitted reagents are not always the way to go for, for this kind of um, high molecular weight work. Is that is that your uh, belief as well? Yeah, I, and it, again, it sort of depends on what you want. So there's a kit that we've used over the years from Kyogen, and it'll deliver DNA that's around 150 to 200 kb, and it, and it delivers that really reliably and regularly. But if you want to push beyond that you've got to go manual. Mm. Um, and there's some other kits coming on the market from Circulomics and Sage that are going to help get there. Uh, but I say right now, most people still are working manually. And what I like about that is that it gives you as a scientist the ability to tweak things, right? And it's when you change things, that's when you learn why particular steps work the way you do. And I think right. it's really empowering. Yeah. And then one day you can go back to a kitted protocol and maybe you'll say, well, what happens if I remove that buffer, that mysterious buffer in the jar? And yeah. we've done that too. We found certain buffers in kits just really, they're alkaline, mm. they can damage the DNA, and you're able to kind of hot swap. And that's not exactly advice we give. We don't tell people to throw yeah. out the manual to their kit, but it's, it's possible to do. This is just, you know, this is medical biology, isn't it? It's also um, it's sort of analogous to cooking or something. You know, mm -hmm. you've got to really understand these processes and, and why the different ingredients are there. Right, um, right. And uh, would you ever go back and actually, you know, would you look at the sample in a microscope? You know, is it very easy? Would you actually look at the cellular, cellular architecture workout? You know, we typically think about lysis and homogenization. Mm -hmm. Would you actually go to that to that level of actually trying to work out exactly what's going on uh, in a kind of in a, on a, in a, on, a, on a macro scale? I would say, in the past, I haven't. Mm -hmm. But our company does a lot of work in single cell sample prep as well. And those two sample types have a lot in common. Mm. One, they're very challenging. Both samples are physically fragile. Mm. And so through all of our work and all of our knowledge that we've gained in terms of generating viable single cell suspensions, we check those on the microscope. Oftentimes we'll just take some of them, pop them open and throw them in salting out and you get gorgeous DNA out. Mm. So if you do have workflows where you have viable cells and you know how to look mm. at your cellular architecture, if it's a high quality cell suspension, probably going to give you high quality DNA. Actually, I noticed in your video you had a great demonstration of things that maybe people wouldn't even think about like what happens if you drop a tube of, of high molecular weight DNA on the floor. I was pretty surprised by, by what you found there. Yeah, yeah. The, the molecular weight dropped from around 600 to below 400 kb. Wow. Just dropping it on the floor. Just dropping it on the floor. Yes. The kind of thing that you might just do yeah, without thinking about it, pick it up and... Uh, right, because if you had a plasmid, <laughs> it would be fine, or a protein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's amazing, isn't it? It's have, amazing. Have you found any other, um, I mean, in terms of handling, uh, pipetting, um, even the types of tubes you use, have you found that, 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 that that's be important? Tube type, no. Okay. Um, you know, we recommend a wide-bore pipette tip, which is pretty standard. Mm. And I would say people who work with high molecular weight DNA know this, but a good tip for novices too is that if you have a concentrated solution, it's viscous. Mm. If you try and dilute that down, 
first of all, if you take the concentration reading, it's mm. probably not accurate. You have to take it from multiple parts of the two. Right, right. It's very pocketed. If you make your dilution, don't be surprised if you make a 1 to 10 dilution and you get a completely different reading. You really need to let it sit. Mm. You need to let it homogenize and maybe pipette it up and down once or twice with a wide bore and let it sit in the fridge for a while. Mm. I think a lot of people really try and rush it and in that process you're pipetting, you're pipetting, you're pipetting and you're damaging the DNA. Yeah. So yeah. I like to say just take it kind of slow, mm. make your dilution, let it sit, check it multiple parts of the tube, maybe make your dilution again. Mm. Um, but really I would say for us to work and process the number of samples that we've been able to do, we kind of make the calculation from the beginning based on how much material we have we want to aim for a certain concentration at the end so our, our product isn't even viscous to start with. Mm. So we try and find that sweet spot, which for us I think is around 20 nanograms per microliter. Okay. If you make a very concentrated solution to start with, it, it's going to take you forever to dilute it. That makes sense, yeah. And so I know, I know that Josh in the lab um, often likes to resuspend his DNA for, for, for some days, if not if not weeks. Uh, is that is that something you do, or is he, is he just being lazy? He's got <laughs> 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 no, that is definitely standard practice okay. in the field. It's standard practice in the field. I think we try and we try and take our shortcut by just making it at the proper concentration to start with, which is not easy. But if you try and get close, it's a good starting point. Yeah, Again, we work mostly with mammalian, so we're able to do that. I'm not sure Josh works with really challenging samples. No. Um, and it might no, not be possible. Easy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I Cell lines and gram negatives at the moment. Yeah. But, but that's the idea, is to try and take these techniques and, and apply them to, to, to more tricky samples. And um, There's been loads of, of really, really great tips you've given us there. Um, if, if people f try salting out, try the standard process, it doesn't work. Is there a is there an alternative um, yeah, process that the people should 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 try as a kind of second line? I mean, I think the safest, or certainly the most, the technique with the most history is making gel plugs, okay. and that is not an easy technique to learn, but it's great and it's versatile. Mm. Um, and you know this, but maybe a lot of other people don't, but you resuspend intact cells in a polymer matrix, mm. solidify it, and then essentially you're trapping your nuclei and you're trapping your high molecular weight it, DNA inside so you can diffuse in proteases and other lysis enzymes and you can wash the sample up. Um, again, this is very manual workflow and I spent many, many years making gel plugs and I swore I never would again. Mm. So in the last few years I've really focused on trying to figure out um, ways to do it without going down that path, but certainly gel plugs are, I think they're still considered a gold standard method for yeah. dealing with tough samples. Yeah, I mean, we've certainly played with them and, and, and for sure we can do nice extractions and uh, very, very high molecular weight extractions and, and on the Pulsefield gel we can see, you know, mm -hmm. old chromosomes on there for bacteria, for example. But we really struggle getting it actually out of the gel in a, in a usable way, like we struggle with the recovery mm -hmm. and then there's something about the material when it comes out, it doesn't seem to to sequence particularly well in our hands. Uh, I don't know if you've had any experiences like that. Not particularly okay. for the, the 10X platform. Uh, the DNA doesn't have to be super, super, super clean uh, because we dilute it out multiple times during the course of our workflow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, that certainly is a concern. How do you digest the gel matrix? Yeah. How do you get rid of the impurities? Okay, yeah. Well, that, that, so really loads of great tips there. So just a few uh, uh, kind of bonus questions just to kind of to finish us off then um, um, so okay so what are you looking forward to most next in this field what, what, what what's what's what are you excited about uh, where we're going well from a technical perspective I'm excited for people not to struggle anymore okay I think I've seen great progress being made by the community in general over the last few years and I would love for it to get to the place where you know, may, maybe it won't be as easy as a 96 plex robot doing these types of extractions, but it's going to be something that isn't intimidating anymore. And people will kind of, they'll have so much experience and they'll have so many other publications to reference that you really know where to start. That's great, yeah. And a question we're asking everyone, so what, what I would kind of ask you already, but what's the worst sample you've ever had to deal with? <laughs> uh, yeah, what's the genome that really uh, uh, um, keeps you up at night Wakes you up in a cold sweat. 
I would say, well, the most unusual thing we did were, were complete mystery species. So we literally went on, on the walking path behind our office and, and picked bugs. Mm. Uh, it was David Jaffe and, and Nika Kievenvar, and she, mm. she developed the insect DNA protocol, and you, you have no idea what to expect, and for, for that reason it's challenging, right? You can tune your DNA extraction parameters, but once you generate your data set, and we did this with linked reads, and you run the assembler, you might have to iterate and tweak the settings a couple times because you have no idea the genome size, the repeat structure. Um, we assume that they're diploid, but you you, you, right. you don't really know. Yeah, what, right. what else is in there? Are you sequencing the bugs that are in the gut? It's it's those complete unknowns. Complete unknowns, yeah. Okay, very interesting. Okay, well, Jill, thank you very much thank for you. talking to us. It's been a pleasure. Enjoy the rest of AG Beauty. Thanks, you too. We did it! <laughs>